Uh, so uh, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, we'll uh, start today's lecture and I'm going to actually say a little bit more about the result that we proved yesterday, uh, which is a confusing result uh, at, you know, when you encounter it for the first time. Uh, so I'm just going to remind you a little bit and then uh, we'll go on and say a little bit more about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the interesting stuff that happens, uh, the interesting divergence uh, between quantum field theory and gravity. Uh, so let me just remind you what we proved yesterday. So, you know, we said that uh, I didn't introduce this notation, but I'll introduce it now. So let A epsilon be the algebra okay, of operators in the time band uh, zero to epsilon. Okay. Uh, by algebra, uh, this word algebra is, is just a fancy word for the same thing we were saying yesterday. Uh, in that we take all asymptotic field operators. So, you know, you take these operators O of F1 uh, and then you multiply them in all possible ways. So you can take these operators uh, and then you can also, so this is, uh, you know, if O of F1 is an element of the algebra and O of F2 is an element of the algebra, you're allowed to take products of these operators and you're also allowed to take linear combinations. So you're also allowed to construct elements of this kind uh, and you're also allowed to, you know, these all have, uh, if they're not Hermitian operators, if these Fs are not real functions, uh, you can also take complex conjugates. Uh, so this algebra is just some, you know, some set of operators, uh, which is closed undertaking products and linear combinations and complex conjugation. Okay. So it's closed under products, um, linear combinations and, uh, and complex conjugation okay. and Hermitian conjugation. Okay. Uh, so we said if you take A epsilon to be the algebra of operators in zero to epsilon, uh, then uh, the result we proved yesterday was that A epsilon on zero uh, is dense in the full Hilbert space. Uh, or at least, you know, if it's, uh, it's dense in the full Hilbert space, and whenever we say full Hilbert space, uh, there's a question that was asked uh, at the beginning of this lecture about, you know, the fact that really the Hilbert space we are talking about is the Hilbert space that was produced by acting with the algebra from minus infinity to infinity. And we said we could squeeze that, you know, we could squeeze the action of the algebra of operators from minus infinity to infinity on the vacuum uh, to the action of operators from zero to epsilon on the vacuum. Uh, and uh, even the algebra of operators from minus infinity to infinity acting on the vacuum, that Hilbert space, all we said was, you know, it, at least it's a, it's a dynamically closed super selection sector. So when we say full Hilbert space, uh, we are really talking about a dynamically closed super selection sector. It might be that for some other reasons, uh, you decide to you know, include uh, other states in the Hilbert space, but at least if you look at this, this sector of the Hilbert space, uh, which is just produced by acting with, uh, with operators, with asymptotic operators at various times, uh, we said you could produce that same sector by acting with asymptotic operators uh, from zero to epsilon. Uh, so that was the result that we proved at the end of uh, yesterday's class, about which we also had some questions. Uh, so I'm going to give you a few more perspectives to look at this result uh, so that you can understand it better. Uh, so let me first say uh, one thing, which is uh, kind of a fun thing and a simple thing. Uh, I, I want to give you two perspectives in this result. Okay. The first perspective is a perspective from free field theory. Okay. Remember, you know, this result that we proved yesterday was not a result which involved anything uh, to do with gravity. It's a result that's true beyond free field theory, uh, but it's a result that's also true in free field theory. Okay? So in free field theory, and by free field theory, I mean, you know, you take a minimally coupled scalar, which we were studying at the beginning of yesterday's lecture. Uh, you could take some state, say, say we take uh, the state we were discussing yesterday, which was a state with a given energy and angular momentum, which was this state. So we could take the state and then we could say, you know, can you generate this state by acting with operators uh, in the time band uh, zero to epsilon uh, on uh, the vacuum? Okay, so can you generate the same, the same state by acting with operators in the smaller time band in the vacuum? Uh, this is something you can actually check numerically. Uh, you can check it numerically because you're in free field theory and you actually know how to compute inner products. And therefore you could do the following. So you could take so take F tilde Q to be a basis of functions of functions with support in zero to epsilon. Okay. So you can take some basis of functions which have compact support 
And then you could try and do the following. So you have this basis and this basis uh, you can take to be a countable basis. And then you could try and say, let's look for, let's minimize the following quantity. Yeah. NL minus O into F tilde Q, okay. sum with some coefficient CQ acting on zero and the whole square. Okay. So you could minimize this quantity where this sum over Q ranges from Q equal to one to Q max. Okay. So what I've written on the board is actually something pretty simple. I have this state A N the state NL, which I'm trying to approximate, I'm trying to say it can be reconstructed by the action of operators that live in the time man zero to epsilon. I took some basis of such operators. Uh, that basis was obtained by taking this operator O uh, and just smearing it with some F tilde. Now, because I'm allowed to take linear combinations of such operators, I have these coefficients CQ, and then I act on it on the state zero. The reason I can get away by acting with a single O is because this particle to start with is a single particle state. If I had a multi-particle state, I would need to act with two O's. Uh, and then I say, you know, let me not take all elements of the basis. Let me take elements from Q equal to one to some Q max. And then let me just take the square of this. Uh, this is something you can, you know, you can, if you give me some specific basis of functions F tilde Q, uh, you can compute this residual and you can find the coefficients CQ that will minimize this expression. Okay, so you can minimize with respect to CQ. Okay. So this minimum, if I call this minimum R of Q max, like if I, this is the residual R for residual, uh, then you see that R of Q max has to be a monotonically decreasing function of Q max. And you can just put this on a computer. You have to make a choice of this FQ. And then you can just, once you make a choice of this F of this F tilde Q, this basis for, on this, uh, on this uh, interval zero to epsilon, you can make a choice and you can just try and find a better and better approximation to the state NL. And I thought I would just start by showing you what happens if you were to try and do this. Uh, so if you were to try and do this, uh, you tend to get some curve of this kind. So this is a curve of R, what, what we are calling R of Q max. Uh, okay. So this is what I just call R of Q max. And what you have here is Q max. And you see that, you know, initially, if you just take like one element of the basis from zero to epsilon, uh, you minimize it, but the residual is close to one. So these states are like, you know, these states are, are unit normalized and this residual is close to one. And then it drops, it drops, it drops. The fact that it has this shape is some peculiarity of the basis. But you see very soon that, you know, once you're at Q max about 30 here, uh, you're already approximating the state well. Now, of course, the specific numbers that appear here, the 30 and so on has to do with what specific state you choose. I think this, this graph was generated, actually, I don't remember. It was generated with a particular value of N and a particular value of L. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload uh, with the lecture notes, I'll upload on the website, uh, uh, the Mathematica code that was used to generate this. Uh, and you can play around with the code and generate uh, such graphs yourself in free field theory. Uh, this is really a graph, which is just, this is an honest computation uh, in a D-dimensional CFT, I think in a four-dimensional CFT, where we've really put in uh, the Green's function, you know, the computation that you need to do here is, you need to compute the norm of such a state. To compute the norm of such a state, you need a specific value uh, for the Green's function, for this two-point function, this GNL that we talked about yesterday. Uh, so this, this graph that we have here is really an honest graph that's computed and it shows how you really can approximate uh, some energy and angular momentum eigenstate um, by taking approximate uh, linear combinations. Uh, this is the result, of course, in free field theory. Okay, okay. Uh, so that's one point I wanted to make. And as I said, I, I will upload the Mathematica code. So those of you who are interested uh, can play around with the Mathematica code uh, and can, you, know, you can generate such figures for yourself. Okay, good. Uh, the second perspective I wanted to give on this. Okay. Uh, the second perspective uh, is a perspective from ADS CFT. Okay. So, uh, as I said, we are not invoking ADS CFT uh, in this discussion, uh, but uh, you know, if uh, it's always useful, uh, and the reason we are doing ADS is because we know uh, that well-defined theories of quantum gravity fit within the ADS CFT conjecture. The reason we don't want to invoke ADS CFT explicitly is that this is a warm up for flat space where we won't have some notion of ADS CFT. Uh, but it's useful that everything we do in ADS should have a check from the CFT point of view. And if you think about this result from the point of view of the CFT, 
uh, this result is almost kind of trivial because what is this result telling us? It's telling us that we start with some operator O, which is a light primary operator. Okay. And then you just start multiplying it together. And maybe, you know, you start with some set of operators O, maybe not one operator O and the stress tensor and so on. And you just start multiplying this operator together uh, many, many times and you act on it with the vacuum. Okay. And this is the action of the algebra A epsilon on the vacuum uh, gives you states of this kind. Okay. So it gives you states of this kind. Okay. Now, if you notice, if you look at this state, you will see that if you have a light primary operator and you start multiplying it with itself, uh, the right way to think about this in the CFT is to do an operator product expansion. And when you do an operator product expansion, you will find that these products of these light primary operators start generating heavier and heavier primary operators. And if I take the full algebra, then you will end up generating all operators in the theory. Now, once again, there might be some operators that get left out because you know they never appear in the arbitrarily high OP. Uh, but that was what we said about this being a dynamically closed super selection sector. Uh, so, you know, all operators that will appear in this OP will appear that will generate a very large set of primary operators. And you see that, you know, this set of primary operators uh, is, you know, will generate a dynamically closed uh, super selection sector of the Hilbert space. Okay. So, o, uh, so the, the basic point is that products of O uh, generate higher primaries. And then all you're doing is you're acting with these higher primaries in the vacuum. And the act, the fact that the action of all possible primary operators and their descendants also uh, generates all states in the Hilbert space is just what we learn uh, in Polchinski, uh, which is the state operator map. Okay. So the action of higher primaries and their descendants generates the Hilbert space. Okay, so from the point of view of ADS CFT, what we're doing is not, uh, you know, it's kind of a simple result. Uh, you know, if you agree that the Hilbert space is indeed dual to a Hilbert space of a lower dimensional conformal field theory, uh, which, you know, maybe some people uh, who only study gravity may find puzzling, but, uh, you know, from the point of view of ADS CFT, we believe that's true. And then, you know, this is just kind of a very simple result. It just tells you, you take these light primary operators, you multiply them, you generate all sorts of other uh, higher local operators. And then the action of those in the vacuum generates the, the Hilbert space, or at least generates a closed super selection sector in the Hilbert space. At the beginning of this lecture, there were questions about whether you might want to include other sectors in the Hilbert space for other reasons, and you might, uh, but this is dynamically closed. Okay, great. So that's, those are two perspectives which I wanted to give to help you understand yesterday's result. Uh, I now want to ask, uh, say, uh, a third thing about the result yesterday. Uh, just to differentiate it uh, from what we will prove later in this lecture, which is what we call yesterday the principle of holography of information. Okay. So what is uh, at the end of yesterday's lecture, uh, for those of you who were around, we were trying to discuss, um, uh, actually after the lecture yesterday in the discussion, uh, we were discussing a little bit uh, about the physical significance of this result. Okay. So what is the physical meaning of the result? You know, what, what is the, and not only of this result, what is the physical meaning of the Riesz-Leder theorem in general when it's used? Okay. So this result, the fact that A epsilon on zero, uh, I remind you of this notation, A epsilon means, uh, you know, the, the algebra of operators from zero to epsilon. The fact that this generates the Hilbert space, okay. uh, this it, it can be physically interpreted can be physically interpreted as telling us about entanglement between the boundary and the bulk. As telling us about entangle, as telling us basically about entanglement in the vacuum between the boundary and the bulk. Okay, why do I say that? Uh, uh, the reason I say that is uh, that you can think of similar results. I'm going to give you an analogy uh, to try and motivate this physical interpretation. In the end, it's just a physical interpretation, uh, but I'll give you an analogy uh, to explain why this is a plausible physical interpretation. The result is a precise result, uh, but the, the reason you should think about this in terms of entanglement uh, is as follows. Okay? Uh, so let's uh, go away from CFTs and ADS and you know, gravity and all that. Let's just, let's just go back uh, to the first thing we learned in quantum mechanics, uh, which is, uh, you know, the EPR pair. Okay. Uh, so let's take this EPR pair, which is this state. Okay. 
OK? OK. Now, uh, you know, we have these two qubits, uh, but these two qubits are separated far away. This one is on Earth, uh, and we live here. We have access to one qubit, and this one is on Mars. Okay. And there's a Martian who lives here, maybe has four hands uh, instead of having two hands, and uh, uh, has access to the second qubit. Okay. Uh, so the humans who have access to the first qubit and Martians who have access to the second qubit. Uh, so now, uh, you know, uh, we want to, uh, I want to show you how there's a, a similar version, a Riesz-Leader theorem that you can prove, a Riesz-Leader theorem, it's very trivial, uh, that you can prove uh, for uh, this simple EPR pair. Okay. So notice that the Hilbert space obviously is four-dimensional. Uh, that's just because you have two qubits and the Hilbert space is four dimensional. Okay. But notice that by acting on the first qubit with arbitrary Hermitian operators on the first qubit, you can generate from this EPR state all states in the Hilbert space. Okay. So the statement is by acting with arbitrary operators from the first qubit. on qubit one, we generate the whole Hilbert space. So let me prove that. Uh, it's kind of obvious, uh, but let me, let me just prove it for you. Okay. Uh, so let's first take this EPR pair and act. Uh, let me write down the state also once more, uh, so you can keep this in mind. Uh, what I'm going to say is extremely simple. Um, okay. okay. Uh, so let's take this, let's take the state and let's act on this and let's uh, act with one plus sigma z. All these operators only act on the first qubit. Okay, so. So every sigma operator I write down is a operator that acts only on the first qubit. It does not act on the second qubit. Okay. So if I do this, it's a trivial computation. If I act with one plus sigma z, uh, that, uh, you know, that kills, uh, the qubit when the qubit value is one and projects onto states where the qubit value is zero. And so that just gives you twice a into zero, zero. Okay. Okay. I could also act with sigma x plus i sigma y on this EPR pair. Okay. And this will just give you twice a into one zero. The reason is that if you think of how sigma x plus one sigma y acts, it has, uh, you know, sigma x plus i into sigma y takes uh, if you have a zero, takes it to a one, uh, but if you have a one, uh, takes it, you know, just annihilates it. And therefore, sigma x plus i sigma y in EPR gives you twice a into one zero. One minus sigma z, so we talked about one plus sigma z, but we could also talk about one minus sigma z. Uh, this gives us all the states which have one. Okay. And then we could also talk about sigma x minus i sigma y. And this, of course, gives us twice b into 0, 1. Okay. Notice the set of states we have here. Okay. 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. The fact that we get all such states requires us to have both a and b non-zero. Okay. Otherwise, we would be in trouble. Uh, so if you didn't have any entanglement, if the state just looked like 0, 0, or if it just looked like 1, 1, if there was no entanglement, you would not be able to get all four elements of the basis. Uh, but when you do have entanglement, you see you get all four elements of the basis on the right hand side. Okay. Now, this, these are elements of a basis, but if you wanted to produce some other state, let's say you wanted to produce 0, 0 plus 1, 0, all you would do is act with the linear combination of the operators that appear on the left. Okay. So a linear combination of operators that appear on the left can produce for you an arbitrary linear combination of operators that, uh, of the states that, that appear on the right. And therefore, you see that by acting with arbitrary operators in the first qubit, you generate the full Hilbert space, which is the result on top. Okay. So this is a very trivial result. And in fact, this is the analog of what we have proved right now. You know, what we have proved is that, that by acting with operators in one part of the system, uh, if you have sufficient levels of entanglement, you can generate the full Hilbert space. Even though you're acting with operators only on one part of the system, you're not acting with operators everywhere. Uh, you can generate the whole Hilbert space. Okay, so that is in fact a very close analog of what we proved in the case of quantum field theory. Okay. Good. So now let me say a few a few things. Okay, um, this of so course. Sir, can I ask something? 
Yeah. Because you said you need sufficient amount of entanglement. But what does what does sufficient mean? Does it have to be maximally entangled or? It doesn't require maximum In this particular example, you just need the fact that, you know, uh, no element of the density, so no eigenvalue of the density matrix is zero. So here, this will work as long as A and B uh, uh, are both non-zero. In more complicated systems, you know, you could have like more complicated systems where, you, you know, you, you, took, you had two qubits on one side, two qubits on the other side. Uh, what you need is that no element of the density matrix, if you reduce the density matrix on one side, has a zero. I mean, there's no zero eigenvalue for the reduced density matrix on one side. That's what sufficient means. In this particular but do example, you need, uh, zero. Do you need an equal amount of uh, degrees of freedom on both sides, so to say? Do you need uh, yeah, an equal so, amount of degrees of freedom? It's zero to epsilon region, and the Correct. So in this, uh, yeah, good, very good. Uh, so, you know, in the case of quantum field theory, the, the situation is more subtle because you have an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, in the case of, uh, so, you know, when you have an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, the question of, uh, you know, it's hard to compare which side is larger. Uh, so as long as there is some, you know, so in the case of quantum field theory, what happens is that, uh, so let, let me just, going back to this EPR pair, you see that if B was very small, uh, you would still be able to generate this basis, but it would be hard to generate say the state one one because you would have to act with one by b on this side okay to generate the state one one in the case of quantum field theory indeed this is what happens that you know if you look at more and more excited states so states that are very far away uh, those states are you know have less entanglement so there are some modes which have less entanglement and that entanglement tends to drop to zero as you start looking at more and more complicated states and therefore you need to act with more and more complicated operators uh, but the reason it still works is because, you know, you don't have a qubit system. You have some system which has an infinite number of degrees of freedom. And therefore, it's not so easy to say, you know, the, the number of qubits between zero to epsilon is somehow smaller uh, than the number of qubits in the rest of the space. Uh, so uh, in, this, in these simple qubit examples, you're right. Uh, you will need, in fact, that the Hilbert space on one side is as big as the Hilbert space on the other side uh, in order to be able to make this work. Uh, but, the, um, you know, the reason, I, I... yeah. Yeah, I have a question. So, um, so this condition about uh, the density matrix not having uh, any zero eigenvalues, this is a stronger constraint than saying um, it needs to have non-zero von Neumann entropy, right? Oh yeah, yeah, much stronger. Okay, uh, it's much stronger. The, the, you know, the, this is actually yeah. Uh, so the, uh, yeah, the, the, there's a stronger constraint. This is a much stronger constraint. Uh, it's actually uh, uh, you know there's an algebraic way to say to say this. Okay, but let, let me not go there. Uh, yeah, it's much stronger, of course, than saying the von Neumann entropy should be uh, should be non-zero. Uh, so you really need the fact that you don't have zero eigenvalues in the density matrix uh, to make this work. Uh, but all I was saying was in the in the case of the Riesz-Lieder theorem or quantum field theory, it might seem confusing that you know you act with the algebra of operators in this room, and you know if you if you thought of some qubit description, uh, it would seem confusing. But the reason it works is because you have an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, uh, so you can act with more and more complicated operators and and pull out the higher uh, you know basis elements in the Hilbert space uh, to generate more and more complicated states. Uh, also, one more thing. Uh, where did we use in this in this uh, little proof? Where did we pro uh, use the fact that uh, uh, the, the density matrix has has no zero eigenvalues? Here, uh, you see, if you had uh, here the eigenvalues of density matrix are just a squared and b squared. So if you had b no, zero, then this would just become zero. You would not be able to generate these elements. You see, How these elements come with a b. Yeah. So if either a or b was zero, then it would not work. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Great. Uh, can I ask? A question yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, but here we are talking about uh, spatial distance between between these these two qubits. So yeah. I would say this is this relates more directly to the to the first statement that we we to the first proof that we uh, saw yesterday, which is the fact that uh, using the the operators at the boundary we can recreate all the states uh, e even in the bulk uh, uh -huh. rather than. I don't see, I don't see an immediate correspondence with, with the statement that we can squeeze in time. Okay, can, can uh, you can you wait for one minute uh, or maybe a few minutes, and I'll I'll, I'll answer this precise question. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, let me just say a few more things, and I, I I'm going to answer this question. Okay, uh, so so uh, let me just say first first uh, s some simple things. Okay, uh, this actually doesn't allow us to send messages between Earth and Mars. Okay, so if we thought we'd use like Riesz leader to send have superluminal communication between us, uh, you know, uh, you, you cannot use it, okay? Uh, the, you can't use Riesz leader to send. And why is it that you can't use Riesz leader? Right? You might have thought, oh, you know, let me, let me, I have this entangled pair and maybe my, you know, my clever Earth uh, experimenter will act with one plus sigma Z and therefore collapse the qubit on the other side 
and you know whether I acted with one plus sigma z, uh, look here, or whether I acted with one minus sigma z, uh, the person on the other side would either see only zero or either see only one, right? So if I could really do this, then I could you know change the probability distribution uh, for the Martians, and I would use this as a method of having superluminal communication. But of course, that doesn't make any sense, and so it's important that this involves no loss of locality. Uh, and the reason this involves no loss of locality is because we can't actually act with Hermitian operators. We use the word act, uh, you know, in a loose sense uh, to describe like the action of one plus sigma z on EPR. So we say this is the action of one plus sigma z on EPR. Uh, but in fact, this is not a, you know, EPR going to one plus sigma z on EPR is not a physically allowed transformation of state. Uh, what are the physically allowed transformations of states? The simplest physically allowed transformations of state, or you could also say the most general physically allowed transformations of states are those where you act with unitary operators. So if you do EPR goes to unitary operator in EPR, that's allowed. But this one plus sigma z is not a unitary operator. And therefore, you know, EPR goes to one plus sigma z in EPR is not allowed, whereas EPR goes to unitary operator in EPR uh, is allowed. I have a quick question. Like, did you, isn't it a, just a simple projector? One plus, sigma one plus sigma z is a projector, yes, but it's not unitary. But I can always project, right? I can check if it's one or not. No, you have to project in discard. You cannot project the state. You can't force the state to go from EPR to, uh, you know, one plus sigma z in EPR. You can take a bunch of states and you can measure and, you know, you can say that uh, in some states I found one plus sigma z is one, in some other states I found it zero. Uh, and, and that you could do, uh, but you can't, you know, you can't decide that I have an EPR pair and I'm now going to act on it with one plus sigma z and make it something else. Okay, okay. Uh, you, can, you can measure and discard, but that's different. If you measure and discard, you know, that's not changing the probability distribution for the person in mass. The person in mass doesn't care what you discarded or what you didn't, unless you classically communicate with the person. Okay? So what you can do on the other hand is rotate. You can apply a magnetic field to your qubit and you can rotate things, uh, you know, so that all zeros go to one and all ones go to zero, but that never changes the probability distribution uh, for someone on Mars, okay? So we use the word act uh, and I, actually I, uh, uh, this is, I, I, I feel uh, the word act is like kind of an unfortunate mathematical terminology because, you know, we use this verb, but act doesn't actually mean always physical actions. And the other important thing, which I should say is that if you act with unitaries, a unitary on the second qubit, okay? So not only do you, can you not send information, you also can't use this to detect, of course, what the state of the second qubit is. Because if you do something like this, you act with a unitary on the second qubit, you never change the expectation value of any Hermitian operator. So remember I said that you're not allowed to act with Hermitian operators, but you are allowed to measure Hermitian operators. So we can, Sorry, so we can- you have, you have frozen at the beginning of this, this last page. Can you repeat uh, what we're doing? Sorry. Just, uh, just for one second, but- Yeah, I said that, that you know, uh, not only can you not uh, transfer, not only can you not use superluminal communication, you also cannot use this result to obtain any information about the state of the second qubit, uh, because you could measure Hermitian operators x1. You can't act with Hermitian operators, but you can always measure Hermitian operators. So x1 means Hermitian on first qubit. You're allowed to make a measurement and measure its expectation value. But if you act with a unitary on the second qubit, then you don't change any measurement on the first qubit. So you might have thought that, oh, you know, I have these Hermitian operators X1 and their action in the EPR pair produces all states, but you cannot actually use X1 to detect the state of the second qubit. So this is just an obvious fact about quantum mechanics. I'm just saying something which is kind of obvious, but uh, you know, if you act with a unitary in the second qubit, you can't use the fact that you can generate all states by acting with Hermitians on the first qubit uh, to detect what was done to the second qubit. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, this is uh, a second obvious point. Now let me go back uh, from this qubit example uh, to the example that we have been talking about. Uh, so the example that we have been talking about actually involves something pretty similar. 
apart from the fact that you know the issues that we discussed about there being an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, um, you know what what we said is that we acted uh, we act with some operators here, okay, uh, from zero to epsilon, uh, and when you oh uh, it's not visible one second. I have a fondness for red, but red just doesn't work. Uh, okay, good. Uh, so, uh, so we act uh, with operators from zero to epsilon. And uh, as I explained yesterday, you know, in a quantum field theory, you would think about operators that act in zero to epsilon as being causally connected to this region, to this triangle or this causal wedge in the bulk. Okay? So if you acted with operators from zero to epsilon, that is like acting with operators in the shaded region. And the fact that you can get all, you can generate all states tells us that the shaded region has an entanglement, has a lot of entanglement with its complement, which is here. So the, the yellow and pink have a lot of entanglement and that is the interpretation of the results that we proved. Okay. So the fact that A epsilon on zero generates H, I'm going to interpret as the statement that yellow and pink have entanglement. Okay. Uh, now, uh, let me just say that uh, there was a question earlier about, you know, uh, uh, well, uh, let, let, let me say, let, sorry, before I go to that question. Uh, nevertheless, notice that even though yellow and pink have entanglement in a QFT, and we'll discuss in a, so I underline here QFT, in a QFT, uh, and an, in a local QFT, so not in gravity. In a local QFT, we can always find unitary operators that act on this pink region. Okay? So we can find unitary operators that exist U in the pink region that commutes with all operators in zero to epsilon. Okay? With all operators in this A epsilon. So what this means is that I can never distinguish the state zero if I take some operator from A epsilon in a, U, in a local quantum field theory, this is the same as, uh, as uh, the expectation value of X after I have acted in the vacuum with the unitary U. So in fact, even though it is true that the action of X on the vacuum generates for you all states in the Hilbert space, I cannot detect all states in the Hilbert space because I cannot even differentiate the vacuum from the unitary acting on the vacuum, okay? Uh, there was a question earlier about what's the difference between acting in the time map zero to epsilon to acting in, in from minus infinity to infinity. In fact, once I start acting on a length scale, which is longer than the light crossing time of ADS, uh, then, you know, if I start acting on this orange region, which is longer than the light crossing time of ADS, uh, then it's pretty clear that I can generate all states just causally, you know, just causally, it's pretty clear that uh, I can generate all states because, you know, if I act with this, just the, uh, the fact that light can cross, sorry, I, this is a bad light ray. The fact that light can cross from one side to the other, already means that just by causal action on the boundary on the orange region, I can generate all states in the Hilbert space. So that's not surprising because if you take the full orange region, like all times, the fact that you can generate all states is just, you know, doesn't even require entanglement. The fact that you can generate all states from this time band zero to epsilon, which is this yellow shaded wedge, uh, relies on entanglement. But I want to emphasize that once again, this does not involve any violation of locality. And it does not actually give you information about the pink region in the sense that I could change the state in the pink region by acting with a unitary operator U. And I would not be able to tell whether I had changed the state by measuring something in the yellow region in a local QFT. Uh, so I'm now going to explain how things are different in gravity. Uh, but if there are any questions now, uh, we are now going to move on to discuss uh, perhaps a more physically important result about this holography of information. Uh, but if there are any additional questions about the reach leader, I can take them now and then we can go on. I hope this answers also the earlier questions that people had. So if there are questions. I'm trying, questions. To, uh, I'm trying to understand what this research leader means for the monolobity of entanglement. 
does it does it say that uh, because the boundary here between zero and epsilon is entangled with the uh, with this bulk region u, u it sort of uh, it can be entangled within the system itself because all the qubits have to be entangled with the uh, qubits in u. Uh, yeah, so there is entanglement within the system. I guess there's some... Yeah, go on, please. Um, no, yes, I, I, that was, I guess, what I wanted to is, Can there be yeah, yeah. entanglement uh, within, uh, within the, between the boundary degrees of freedom? Uh, because yeah. they should already be uh, entangled with the both degrees of freedom, right? So they, they can be entangled. Uh, you could also think of it in a different way. You know, you could think, uh, that's why I drew the, the yellow region. Uh, you could just think of these operators we're talking about in zero to epsilon as being the operators that live on the yellow part of the Cauchy slice. So in a local quantum field theory, not in a holographic theory, I emphasize that's why I've underlined LQFT, uh, you know, the operators in zero to epsilon are literally dual to the operators in the yellow shaded region. So if I was to complete the Cauchy slice, uh, these operators in zero to epsilon are dual to operators here, just in the yellow part, I can just complete the Cauchy slice. So the fact that you can generate all operators by acting with this operators in time and zero epsilon is the same as saying you can generate all states by acting with operators on part of the Cauchy slice. You don't need to act with operators on the full Cauchy slice. You can just act near the edges of the Cauchy slice and that's enough to generate the full Hilbert space. So uh, this entanglement, you can just think of as entanglement between different regions in the bulk, some region which is close to the boundary and another region which is close to the center of ADS. Okay. Uh, can I, uh, so uh, did any of these statements depend on depend on the fact that we have fully reflecting boundary conditions? Uh, do any of these statements depend on the fact that we have fully because, reflecting boundary conditions? Because I, I see from this qubit uh, analogy, the, the operators on the yellow wedge can create anything on anything on the time slice, including the pink uh, line. Uh, but then, then, uh, then, so I'm imagining when I am, when I'm creating a future state, uh, beyond epsilon window of time, uh, I should I'm I'm effectively creating a state in the pink pink part of the Cauchy slice, right? Yeah, yeah. So, sorry, I, I want to say once again, uh, you can't create like you can't physically create a state. So there's no superluminal communication involved here. Uh, this is what I was emphasizing with the qubit analogy. Now, the fact that you can, uh, you know, you that you should you should be careful about the word act which we use. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you, you can act with operators in zero to epsilon, but you can't actually create something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. What, that I understand. It's just, just algebraically, not not physically. I'm exactly. not creating a state. Exactly. So, uh, so, uh, so, so it seems yeah. like if I want to uh, like act act with an operator and create a state in the pink part of the new slice, uh, pink part of the Cauchy slice, and and create a state which is equivalent to something being thrown in at a later time than the epsilon time window, I kind of need a totally reflecting boundary condition. Um, you know, you need a well-defined Hilbert space. It's not that, uh, let's see, uh, uh, um, you know, you could ask if you, if I'm not sure that that's the case, you know, you could, you could take this ADS and you could couple it to something else, to an external system. And uh, you would still have some sense in which, you know, this little uh, yellow region would be, in, if you just had a QFT, you didn't have gravity, then you could take this ADS and couple it to some, some external bath. And this yellow region would still be able to generate states, uh, you know, uh, inside the bulk and also outside the bulk. So if you just had, you know, if you embedded this ADS within some bigger Minkowski space or something like that, uh, you would still be able to generate states both within this pink region and also the region outside uh, because everything would be entangled with everything else. I mean, provided there was maximal entanglement. Uh, not maximum, provided there was sufficient entanglement. So I'm not sure that maximal, that you need uh, reflecting boundary conditions for this. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, um, uh, yeah, uh, could you repeat the conclusion of this slide once, once more? The conclusion of this slide was just that, uh, you know, was just to say that this result tells us about entanglement uh, and it doesn't allow you to get information. So this result that A epsilon on zero generates H, this, this result that we found, it tells us about entanglement. That's the physical interpretation of the result. And it does not tell you about information because you can act with unitaries in the bulk that commute with all operators here. Okay, so that was, the, that was the result of the slide. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, great. Very good. So now we want to move on to a more interesting, uh, and no more interesting, but a different result, uh, which is which is now uh, the result that's more relevant for, for black holes and for gravity and for the information paradox. Uh, so now we want to prove uh, what we will call the holography of information, okay, uh, which holds only in gravity. Okay, so everything we've been saying so far is true both in LQFT and in gravity. So this holds only for gravity. And here I want to prove 
something uh, very different uh, from the intuition I was giving you previously from LQFT. I want to say that the words that go with this is that a copy of, so a copy of all information on the bulk of a Cauchy slice is available near the boundary, okay? So these are the words. We'll now make this precise. Okay. Uh, what does it mean uh, to say that a copy of all the information on the bulk of a Cauchy slice is available near the boundary? Uh, so the first words I need to explain are, what does it mean to say that we are near uh, the boundary, okay? So near the boundary, in fact, is something uh, you shouldn't be surprised how we'll make near the boundary precise. Uh, you know, we, all the discussion that we had so far is kind of leading up to making, defining what we mean by near the boundary. You know, what we really want to say is that we have, uh, we have this ADS region and we have some, some Cauchy slice that runs through it. And we want to say that in what, uh, we, we want to say that in a theory of gravity, uh, even though we were saying in a local quantum field theory, you could specify, you know, uh, the green part of the slice and the yellow part of the slice, like independently. Uh, we actually want to say that, I don't know if you can see, but the green is the thick part that I'm making towards the edges. Uh, I want, we want to say that in fact, all the information here in the bulk, all in. all info here is also available here. Okay. So that's the result that we, we want to prove. Okay. That all the information on the bulk slice uh, on the middle, like all the information in this part of the slice, uh, like this, this white, white part of the slice is also available on the edges of the slice. Okay. Uh, but of course, in a theory of gravity, uh, you would immediately say that that sounds like a like not a very precise statement uh, because the fact that I'm drawing this Cauchy slice and talking about something in the middle and something near the edges uh, seems to require that I have some kind of a fixed space time background. And in a theory of gravity, as we have already discussed many times, what you keep fixed are the asymptotic boundary conditions. And so to say that there is some information near the middle, which is available near the boundary, uh, you know, gives too much weightage to the notion of near the middle and, away and near the boundary. And so what we will actually prove is that we are going to change near, maybe I should, we're going to change the notion of the, the green slice uh, to actually being this little time band zero to epsilon, okay? So instead of saying that all the information is available on the green slice, which is near the edges, we are going to say all the information is available on this time band here. So I'm, we are going to move the arrows. So rather than saying the, uh, all the information is available on the green part of the Cauchy slice, we're actually going to say all the information in the Cauchy slice is available uh, by making measurements in the small time band uh, from zero to epsilon. Okay? I emphasize that this is not true in a local quantum field theory. In a local quantum field theory, as we just emphasized, you could take a local quantum field theory with ADS boundary conditions. It would just not be true that all the information in the bulk would be available in the small time band zero to epsilon. Uh, and so it's a very uh, striking statement and it's much, much stronger than the statement uh, that we have proved previously. Okay? So this is much, much, much stronger than the Riesz leader statement, okay? Uh, in that, uh, so uh, the Riesz leader uh, statement told you that, you know, we could generate all states by acting with this time band, but now I'm saying we can actually detect all states by acting, uh, by measuring operators in this time band, okay? Uh, let me make this a little more precise. So there are two ways you can make this precise. So one way is say there are two states which are distinct. So we have two states which are not equal to each other. Then we will prove that there exists some operator X uh, which belongs, or maybe I have A, so let me call it uh, A which belongs to this algebra, I'm well, sorry, maybe I should use X because otherwise I'll get, uh, which belongs to this algebra A epsilon. So this is, remember, this is the algebra we've been talking about. There is some element of this algebra, 
which has the property that psi one x psi one is not equal to psi two x psi two. So remember, uh, I told you how in a local quantum field theory, if I just took the vacuum and I acted in it with the unitary in the bulk for all elements of the algebra, I would not change the expectation value. Now I want to tell you that in gravity, that's not the case. In fact, if I tell you the expectation value of all elements of the algebra for any two distinct states, I can identify them in the sense in that there are two distinct states which are distinct in the bulk. I can distinguish them by measuring some element of the algebra. Uh, there is another way of saying this equivalent statement. Now the equivalent statement is that all operators that map this Hilbert space back to itself can be approximated arbitrarily well by operators in, in A epsilon. So earlier we were saying we could get all one way of thinking of the difference between this and this Riesz leader result is earlier we were saying we could get all states in the Hilbert space by acting with operators in A epsilon in the vacuum. Now we are saying, you know, we can actually get all operators in this algebra itself. And that you see is clearly something that just is not true in the local quantum field theory. You know, the operators towards the edges are not all operators in the theory. There are distinct operators in the theory that live in the bulk. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the result that we would uh, like to prove. Uh, let me just uh, say, even before we start, that if, you know, from the point of view of ADS-CFT, this result is, uh, you know, kind of, uh, is kind of obvious. It's kind of obvious because, you know, when you talk about this algebra of operators on the boundary time band from zero to epsilon, uh, this algebra of operators is just the algebra of all CFT operators uh, in a time band. And the algebra of all CFT operators on a full time band, on, in fact, on even in a single time slice, uh, is clearly uh, complete. Uh, and you know gives you the set of all operators in the theory uh, so i should say that that this result is kind of trivial uh, from the perspective of ads cft okay. uh, if you is trivial uh, from the perspective of ads cft uh, but uh, we are not invoking ads cft here and uh, the reason as i said this is of interest is we later want to talk about flat space and black holes and flat space where we don't have ads cft so you can also think of it as an explanation of ADS-CFT, of why ADS-CFT works in gravitational theory. As in, or at least as an explanation of some aspects of ADS-CFT, as an explanation of the information theoretic aspects of ADS-CFT. So you can, you know, if you, if you assume ADS-CFT, then this result is kind of true, but uh, we are not going to assume it and we are going to prove that this is true for all theories of gravity. And this explains, I think, one of the most important aspects of ADS-CFT, which is the fact that all the information about the bulk is available in the boundary uh, at one time. Okay, okay. so let me, let's go on to prove uh, this result. Uh, it's actually, uh, we've in fact done uh, most of the work. Uh, so uh, let's go on to, to prove the result. So what is the thing which is different about gravity? Uh, uh, as opposed to local quantum field theories. So the main physical, the main physical input we are going to use is going to be a very, uh, it's going to be like a, an almost trivial kind of physical input. Okay? It's the fact that the energy in gravity can be measured from infinity. Okay, let me give you a few perspectives on this. Okay. Uh, so I'll give you three perspectives in this. Okay. Uh, so this is a result we, we discussed earlier as well. The first perspective is what we learn in, uh, in school. It's the fact that there's a Gauss law for gravity. Okay. Uh, so if you have some, some mass and you go far away, very far away where the gravitational field becomes weak, uh, then you can measure how much mass is sitting inside uh, just by, you know, integrating the gravitational field in a Gaussian sphere. So, you know, it's the fact that you can measure how much energy is sitting inside just by, just by integrating the gravitational field. Uh, and uh, there is a version of this uh, that works also in ADS, uh, which tells you that if you have an excitation in ADS, uh, you can determine what the energy of the excitation is uh, by doing some integral near infinity. And that goes as follows. 
So how does the Gauss law work in ADS? So in ADS, uh, let me give you a precise version. Uh, you need to choose some boundary conditions. As I said, we chose boundary conditions yesterday for a field, uh, but you also need to choose boundary conditions for the metric. Uh, and the boundary conditions you choose for the metric, the analog of these normalizable boundary conditions is that first we choose a gauge. So it's easiest to specify the boundary conditions in a gauge. So we choose what's called Pfeffer and Graham gauge. And what that means is that we set H R mu equal to zero near the boundary. Uh, and then for the other components for H I J. Okay, so this is not, none of them I J are not equal to R. We choose the boundary condition that as R tends to infinity, they die off as R to the D minus two. Okay. So we choose some boundary conditions um, on, um, yeah, I think there's some question. Maybe. So, uh, yeah, go on. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so by uh, saying that uh, we the boundary condition we serving kind of D for uh, with uh, some data given a boundary. Sorry, I I don't I didn't understand the question. You said something about data given at the boundary. Uh, uh sorry. Uh, let me just. Uh, I, there's some problem in my connection, but let me just answer if I understood correctly. Uh, you know, when we say we choose boundary condition. Oh, sorry, I think... The, you're trying to uh, uh, some kind of... so generally is this me or is there a problem with the connection? no i i think i think his audio is slightly problematic okay uh so le le let me just let me just try and answer shans because i think there's some problem with the audio kind of so... yes yeah, let, let me just try and answer the question yeah, the, Uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I, sorry, I think sorry, I got the go question. Can I just try and answer? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. the point is that, that uh, you know, uh, when you specify boundary conditions, that's part of the definition of the theory. You know, to define the theory, you have to allow, you have to specify what kind of excitations are allowed. Uh, so in specifying the boundary conditions for the metric, we are just saying that, you know, these are the excitations that are allowed. You need to do this also in gravity. Now, even if you do a path integral, you need to specify what are the kinds of excitations that are allowed near the boundary? And the condition we're demanding here is that the excitations that are allowed are such that HIJ goes to one by R to the D minus two, which is roughly the statement that, you know, the excitations don't destroy the asymptotic structure of the field. Okay. So with these boundary conditions, uh, is there, was there another question I saw? Maybe Rifat had a raised hand. Hello. Yeah. Uh, can you go to the previous slide, please? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, a previous slide again. Yeah. This yeah. One. In the second, yeah. In the second point, did you mean that uh, operators in the bulk cannot be uh, arbitrarily approximated by operators in A sigma? No, no, they can be because these are all operators in the okay. Hilbert space. So all operators can be. So that's the surprising part that in fact even bulk operators can be approximated arbitrarily well by operators in this boundary time time. Even in local quantum field theory, right? No, 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 not in local quantum field theory. So this is not, none of this is true. Not uh, true. In that's why my question is because in, in even in local quantum field theory, you can uh, from the previous uh, thing, uh, you can write down a bulk operator in terms of uh, O of T comma omega smeared out in the entire uh, boundary. Correct. Yes. Yes. But now we want to. And, so you. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And all of those O of T comma uh, uh, omega, which is smeared in, in the entire boundary, can be well approximated by uh, elements in A, A sigma. Not so does that not... Not in an LQFT. In an LQFT, it's not... Uh, that's what I was trying to emphasize. It's not true that uh -huh. operators in this region can be approximated by operators here. You see what... This is what I was saying about the qubit example. Think of this as being the first qubit, as this being qubit one. Okay. And this is like qubit... Uh, this middle part is like qubit two, so I, we never said that all operators in the second qubit you can generate by acting with operators in the first qubit. The Riesz-Lie theorem only said you can get all states, but clearly operators on on like these triangles are not the same. You know, those are not the same as the operators in the middle. The operators in the middle are different in an LQFT. Uh, yeah. You know, those okay. are operators like on the second qubit. 
So now we are going to prove something stronger, which is true in gravity, which is that, you know, there is no this, you know, you don't have this notion of a first qubit and a second qubit. You can get operators in the middle also from operators near the boundary. Uh, but in an LQFT, it would of course not be true. There are distinct operators in the middle and distinct operators near the edges. Uh, so that the squeezing, sorry, uh, so, uh, the squeezing of that Hilbert space that you did, uh, that saying all of O T comma sigma uh, smeared out in the entire bo uh, boundary can be approximated by elements in A sigma. That is not true in LQFT, correct? No, no. Let me, let me what I proved, we didn't prove that all O T comma sigma. We proved that the action of O T comma sigma on the vacuum. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, notice this, O T comma zero can be rewritten as, written as X zero. Notice that there's this state here. So we said that the state, this is the result we proved that the action of an operator from the larger algebra on the vacuum on a particular state can be rewritten as the action of an operator from the smaller algebra on a particular state. This is not the same as a statement that OT comma Sigma is the same as X. Okay. So I emphasize again, this qubit analogy, you know, in the qubit case, you could act with operators from qubit one and qubit two, and you would generate all the full Hilbert space. But you could also decide to squeeze the Hilbert space by just acting with operators in the first qubit, you would get the same Hilbert space. Okay. So we okay. never proved that all OT comma Sigma is the same as X. We proved that the action of OT comma uh, Omega on the vacuum is, can be rewritten as the action of X on the vacuum. That's that this does not imply that O of T Omega is equal to X. This just means that the, their action in the vacuum is the same. Okay. That's what we proved. And that's true in LQFT. But now we are going to prove something stronger, which is that in fact, you can find a representation for OT comma omega in X. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. okay uh, Suvra, Suvra yeah. just one, one, uh, one thing in the chat. Akhil is uh, asking that in a CFT, if he has all the states, uh, he has all the operators, right? You have all states, you have all operators. No, if you have yes. all states, you don't have all, what do you mean by if you have all states, you have all, no, if you have all states, you still don't have all operators. In a, C, uh, in a CFT, uh, uh, if you had, you know, what do you mean if you have all states, if you can generate all states, you have all operators. No, that's not true. Uh, you I know, in a CFT, a when, states and states and operators are equivalent, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the, the, uh, so we have to be careful here. Uh, once again, you know, you can generate, remember in a CFT, you can generate all local operate all states by acting with local operators and operators at a point, you just take operators at point zero act on the vacuum with them. That gives you all states in the theory. But there are more operators in the CFT than there are operators just at the point zero. Right? So if you just act with operators at point zero on the vacuum, that generates for you the full Hilbert space. Uh, but you don't have, you know, the full uh, in a CFT. In fact, there would be an analog of you just take a CFT on Minkowski space. Uh, there would be an analog of the Riesz-Lieder theorem, which is you act with operators in a small region, like on the stable, uh, on uh, the vacuum. That will generate for you all states in the Hilbert space. But there are more operators in the CFT than there are operators on the stable. So in the CFT, the state operator map tells you the action of all operators from a single point, local operators generates for you uh, all states, but there are other operators in the world, you know, which are operators at a different point. And uh, so, you know, uh, those are, those are different operators. So the set of states is, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, so we should be, you should be careful about that. You know, you, you can okay. take the set of states, map them down to local operators in the, on, at one point, uh, and you can take the set of local operators at one point act in the vacuum, uh, but there are other, you know, the fact that you can generate all states from operators in one region doesn't tell you have access to all operators. In a CFT is certainly not true. A CFT is a local quantum field theory. Whenever you get confused about this, I just want to emphasize one thing. Since the, uh, whenever you get confused about this, please just think about unitary operators and locality. Okay. Uh, just think of the fact that, you know, what we are saying in a local quantum field theory, it can never be true that you have access to all operators in the world from operators in one region. Just remember, you can, you can, you know, there's a micro causality, which tells you that there is a unitary which acts somewhere else, like outside this room, which commutes with all operators in this room. So you can never have all information by just acting with operators from one part of the room. So whenever you get confused about this, please just think about, about unitarity. Uh, just think about micro causality and the fact that you can have unitary operators that commute with operators in this room. Okay, okay great. Uh, so so uh, uh, let, let's, uh, let's choose. Sorry, uh, can, can I just go on, please? And we can yes. postpone some discussion, Shreyans, uh, till later. Yes, yes, yes. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, there's a version of the, the, the Gauss law uh, also in, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in ADS. 
And the version of the Gauss law with these kinds of boundary conditions uh, is in fact just tells you that the energy is given by, in this case, just taking the limit as r tends to infinity okay, of the integral of the HTT component times r to the d minus two. Okay, uh, so you just take, oh sorry, d d minus one omega into r to the d minus two into HTT. Okay, so this uh, integral uh, over the boundary sphere uh, of the subleading component of the metric, uh, after you have scaled it up with the right power of r. Uh, gives you the energy uh, in global ADS. This is the precise version of the Gauss law. Uh, this is the analog of what we are taught in school, which is you take the gravitational field far away, you integrate it, uh, you do g dot uh, uh, ds, you integrate it, gives you the mass. Uh, this is how that looks like in ADS. Okay? Uh, this is in a particular gauge. Uh, if you want to see other expressions, uh, see this paper by Krauss and Balasubramaniam. Uh, and you can also see uh, this paper by Hawking and Horowitz, uh, which gives you expressions in other gauges, uh, but they're all basically saying the same thing. They're just saying that, you know, there's a version of the Gauss law that holds in ADS, uh, which also holds uh, classically. Now, let me say, let me give you a second perspective on this. You know, you might say, why is the energy, why can you measure the energy at infinity? Okay. So why is it that you can measure the energy at infinity? You know, usually the energy is some bulk integral, right? We take some bulk Hamiltonian density, and we integrate the bulk Hamiltonian density to get the energy. Why is it that you're able to measure the energy at infinity? You see, the reason is quite simple. It's the fact that, you know, we have, let's say you take a Cauchy slice. In a theory of gravity, you know, here's my initial Cauchy slice. This is the Cauchy slice I chose. Now, in a theory of gravity, there's a sense in which you can do, you know, you can specify the state on this Cauchy slice. And let's say I said the state on the Cauchy slice was psi. But now you could come along and say, well, you know, I don't like to use that Cauchy slice. I want to use a Cauchy slice that goes up a little bit in time and then comes back down. Okay? So there is a sense in which you can do local time reparameterization. So you can push time forward in some region and not push it forward in some other region. So you can take a different Cauchy slice that has that asymptotically tends to exactly the same Cauchy slice as I have, but differs in the bulk. Now, the state that you are describing is just a redundant description of the state that I am describing. Okay? It's just another description of the state because you just acted with some small diffeomorphism, uh, which, is not, which does not generate a physical transformation of the state. If you act with a small diffeomorphism, the principle in all gauge theories, including gravity, is that you don't get a new state. How do you write down this, the fact that acting with these small diffeomorphisms doesn't generate a new state? In fact, these small diffeomorphisms, these small push forwards in time are generated by the bulk Hamiltonian density. And uh, the constraint that, you know, the theory is invariant or states are invariant under these kinds of small time reparameterizations is represented by the fact that HX, this H bulk X at some point X. So by, when I say X, I mean, uh, I mean at some local point X uh, acting on the state Psi is equal to zero, okay? This is called the Wheeler-DeWitt constraint. Uh, and it basically just tells you this, you know, it tells you that the bulk Hamiltonian vanishes. And therefore, if I take H, not H of X, if I try and write down H on Psi, now H means the Hamiltonian, it must reduce to a boundary term because the bulk term has to vanish. And this just arises from the fact that, you know, in the bulk, I can do these local time deparameterizations. And therefore, it must be the case that the Hamiltonian is a boundary term. And this is a very general statement that follows provided, you know, your theory has diffeomorphism invariance. Actually, it's wrong to say the theory has diffeomorphism invariance because diffeomorphism invariance is not a symmetry. It's a redundancy in description. And this redundancy in description, uh, you know, forces this constraint on the wave functions. It tells you that there is there are different descriptions of the wave function, one where you have a description on this slice, another where you have a description where you push it forward in some region. Those are the same. Therefore, it must be the case that the action of the local bulk Hamiltonian is zero. And the only part of the Hamiltonian that remains is a boundary term. And that's the term that we wrote down previously. Okay, so that's the second perspective. Let me give you a third perspective on the fact that this, this Hamiltonian... So, uh... 
as uh, this uh, perspective is true assuming semi classical gravity to be valid uh, meaning uh, in a ge general quantum theory of gravity we may not uh, expect uh, yeah this this is not true using i mean it's not semi classical gravity it would be true uh, provided you can formulate uh, the theory in a you know provided you have a description in terms of a wave functional of fields and there is a notion of diffeomorphism invariant Uh, so the first perspective uh, was uh, one perspective where i said you know there's a classical perspective in the gauss law now i'm giving you a perspective which is true in canonical gravity i'll give you a third perspective which is true uh, uh, so this is a, this is a perspective which is true in canonical gravity provided you can formulate the theory in a way that diffeomorphism invariance is, re is respected okay. uh, so let me give you a third perspective uh, and maybe that will answer your question uh, thank you Uh, so let me give you a third perspective, which comes from uh, ADS-CFT. Uh, so in fact, there's an, uh, this statement that the Hamiltonian is a boundary term. Uh, there's a third way you can look at it, and the third way is just uh, how you would look at it in ADS-CFT. In ADS-CFT, we have something called an extrapolate dictionary. Uh, so the extrapolate dictionary tells you that the boundary limits of bulk operators so there's some uh, chandramouli uh, maybe uh, you need to mute yourself i think there's some background uh, there's a uh, chandramouli uh... uh no no there was shreyansh i just mute him oh, okay okay. Yeah. okay great thanks yeah yeah okay uh, so uh, so the boundary limits of bulk operators okay. are boundary operators that's what the cft uh, the extrapolate dictionary in ads cft tells you okay um okay uh, so in the in in particular what does the extrapolate dictionary uh, tell us uh, for the metric okay. it tells us that the metric is dual to the stress tensor and in fact it tells us that the limit of the metric in this fefferman graham gauge is the boundary let me write down a proportionality constant there's a proportionality constant that you have to normalize correctly so it depends on how you normalize the bulk stress tensor and the boundary metric the bulk metric and the boundary stress tensor uh, but it tells you that you know the the limit of the bulk metric is the boundary stress tensor okay. so you see that in ads cft it is indeed the case that if you look at the subleading component of the metric as you go to r tends to infinity you do get the boundary stress tensor and therefore it's obviously true that the integral of at 0 0 is equal to h or you know because the integral of ttt the integral of the tt component of the stress tensor is equal to h okay uh, so here's the third perspective which tells you that this is also true in in a, in ads cft which is one case where we know how to define quantum gravity well okay So all these three perspectives tell you that you know you do expect it to be true that in some quantum theory of gravity you can still measure the energy from infinity. In fact, I'm going to say as we discussed at the beginning of this lecture, I'm going to require a slightly weaker result. But all these three perspectives suggest that the energy can be measured from infinity in gravity. Uh, later we'll weaken this a little bit uh, as we discussed at the beginning of the lecture but this is actually already a quite a robust statement and i've given you three ways uh, to look at the statement okay let me now uh, say uh, one more thing okay let's ask the following question so i said the energy can be measured from infinity so what if we measure the energy okay. so what what do i mean by that you know let's imagine that that we have uh, some state uh and uh there's some complicated state you know maybe it's some 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 black hole or uh, so there's some excitations that are living around and you know i i have i go off to infinity and then i measure the energy by measuring the asymptotic value of the metric okay so if you measure the energy what uh do you expect will happen so let's say you're in a state psi and we measure it So what should happen if you measure h in a state psi well there are some rules of quantum mechanics uh, that tell you what should happen uh, if you measure h uh, in a state psi and the rules of quantum mechanics tell you that we can get 
values a value e with a probability that is given by psi pe psi where pe is the projector onto states with energy e right uh, this is just elementary quantum mechanics okay it's what we learn in chapter 1 of sakurai it's the fact that if you make a measurement the born rule tells you that you know the you can get various probabilistic answers for the measurement and the probability that you get a value e is given by the expectation of the corresponding projector in the state that you're measuring things at okay? there is a particular projector we are interested in which is we can ask let's say you measure the energy you're in a quantum state there is some probability you know maybe uh, the state actually looks like it has some classical energy but maybe it has some small admixture of the vacuum so there's some probability that you could get zero so the probability that one gets zero is given by psi and p0 on psi where this p0 is the projector on the vacuum so there is a physical sense in which you can measure the energy and you can ask what is the probability with which you get zero and because the edge because the energy is an observable or we are making an assumption that based on these three perspectives that in the theory of quantum gravity the energy is an observable near infinity the projector on the vacuum which is just telling you something about the probability distribution when you measure this energy is also an observable near this boundary so this is also an element of a epsilon okay i gave you a physical argument but in fact there is a formal argument to say this you know whenever an operator is an element of the algebra remember i said the algebra is closed under uh, products and under linear combinations all spectral projectors of the operator are also elements of the algebra so if an operator is belongs to epsilon belongs to an algebra then its spectral projectors also belong to the algebra okay. uh but you don't have to use uh this uh, uh fancy algebraic uh, statement uh it, there's something pretty simple in physical which is the fact that you know you you can measure the energy if the energy is an observable you can measure it the standard rules of quantum mechanics tell you that if you measure the energy uh there is some probability you could get various values quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory uh, there's no definite answer you will get and uh, you know there's some probability you'll get zero and you can measure that probability just by taking you know a system and by by counting how many times you get zero uh if you do that you will end up measuring the projector on the vacuum uh, and there's a formal way to say it which is that you know if an operator is an element of a epsilon we said h is an element of a epsilon if an h so if in this case sorry in this case h is an element of a epsilon and so its spectral projectors are elements of a epsilon okay great so we now have this projector on the vacuum uh, and we have said that this projector on the vacuum is also an element of this asymptotic algebra So now let me point out that this is actually a very very remarkable property of gravity. Okay, this sounds like you know I, I introduced it in some way that sounded a little mundane. Uh, you know, if you measure the energy and you ask how much, uh, you know, what's the probability you get zero? But let me point out this is a a very remarkable property of gravity that the projector on a particular state is an element of the asymptotic algebra. uh you know you might have thought that in gauge theories there is a notion of charge right and in gauge theories uh you could have maybe projected onto states of zero charge but if you project onto states of zero charge you will end up projecting not onto a specific state but onto an infinite dimensional manifold of states because you know there are many states that you act with any gauge invariant operator on the state of zero charge you get another state of zero charge and therefore there is not one state of zero charge 
On the other hand, in gravity, there is one state of zero energy. And so if you project onto the vacuum, you end up projecting onto one of these low energy states. And that's a very remarkable property. In fact, the only property we will need for the argument as we go forward is that this projector on the vacuum is a well-defined asymptotic operator. So as we discussed, you know, it may not even be the case that in some full theory of quantum gravity, this boundary energy uh, can be used to exactly measure the energy of the bulk. If you have some black hole states and there are some states which are, uh, you know, labeled by, uh, which are differentiated by very small gaps in energy, maybe, you know, we can't measure the energy that accurately. But at low energies, there are well-defined gaps between states. And it's a well-defined question to ask whether you get the answer zero. And the real assumption that we will need is that P0, or the assumption that we have made plausible, is that this P0 is an element of E epsilon. Okay? So this is the physical thing that I said is true about gravity. And it's a very remarkable fact about gravity uh, that the projector onto a specific state is an element of the algebra. Okay, let me just go forward and complete the argument, which actually now is just a few lines, and then we can come back and discuss this and also discuss the difference with gauge theories. Okay, so now let's put everything together. Okay, so now the argument is actually very simple, uh, and let me just complete it. Okay. So let's say we said that there are two states, uh, psi1 and psi2, which are distinct states. So say we have psi1, which is not equal to psi2. Okay, very good. So there must be, the fact that they're not equal means there must be some operator, some operator in the theory, uh, which can differentiate between them. So there must be some x This x right now is not an element of A epsilon. I just said there's some x so that psi one x psi one is not equal to psi two x psi two. That's what it means for two states to be distinct. Okay. Now let's choose some basis for the Hilbert space. Okay. Uh, you choose your favorite basis for the Hilbert space. So choose a basis for the Hilbert space. And let's call its elements n. Uh, this is just some notation. I'm just calling it N. This doesn't mean it's a free field basis or anything. Okay. So it's just, just notation. Okay. Then this operator X that I have can be expanded in a complete, uh, in this basis, which is some basis for the Hilbert space. So I, I should be able to write X Okay, this is the operator X that is going to differentiate between the states psi one and psi two, and I can expand it out in a complete basis of states. Okay, so now let's invoke first this Riesz leader theorem that we spent so much time on. So there exist Xn and Xm that belong to A epsilon so that N is equal to Xn on zero and m is equal to xm on zero. Okay, this is the Riesz leader theorem, or the, the version of the Riesz leader theorem. Okay, so if this is the case, uh, so please uh, follow uh, uh, the argument, and uh, uh, I can write this expression in this form. Till this step, everything is also true in a local quantum field theory. Till this step, everything also holds in LQFT. It also holds in LQFT because this Riesz leader theorem also holds in LQFT. So at this step, we have not proved that this X is an element of this A epsilon. Now let me copy this and explain how things are different in gravity. Okay. Now notice there is something uh, which you probably already see here. 
which is you see in the middle this structure zero zero. Okay, the structure zero zero is nothing but this projector on the vacuum that we just talked about. So I can rewrite this as x n p zero x m dagger. So far, so good. But in a theory of gravity, and only in a theory of gravity, in gravity, and only in gravity, only in gravity, not in any other theory, P0 is an asymptotic observable, which is what I emphasized. Right? Now, in a theory of gravity, notice that Xn is always an asymptotic observable. Xm is an asymptotic observable. Xm dagger is also an asymptotic observable. So what you have here, this object, is just a linear combination of products of elements in, or in this A epsilon. And we said in so the beginning. Was... Sorry, can you can you just oh, let me complete, please? Uh, and then then I, I'll take questions. Give me a couple of minutes. Uh, so we said in the beginning that if you take a linear combination of products of elements in an algebra, uh, then the algebra is closed under taking a linear combination of products, under taking a linear combination and undertaking products. Therefore, in a theory of gravity. And because only in a theory of gravity, P0 is also an element of the asymptotic algebra, we see that only in gravity, once again, so only in gravity, X is an element of this boundary algebra. Okay. And I emphasize the reason it happens is because it is only in gravity that every expression that appears here is an element of the boundary algebra. And therefore, it's only in gravity that x is also an element of the boundary algebra. And therefore, we have proved that there exists an x which belongs to the boundary algebra. So that psi 1 x psi 1 is not equal to psi 1 or psi 2 x psi 2 where psi one and psi two uh, were these distinct states uh, that I described earlier. Alternately, as I said, you could think of some other element of the Hilbert space, and you could always expand that element of the Hilbert space in some basis. And this formalism would allow you to rewrite that element of the Hilbert space as an element of the boundary algebra. Okay? And the reason that this magic happens is because gravity has this very special property, which is that the energy can be measured from infinity and therefore, the projector on the vacuum is an element of the boundary algebra. And that's what allows all information or all operators, in fact, to be squeezed to this time band from zero to epsilon. Okay, okay. let me just summarize what I said. Uh, it's a surprising result, so we'll discuss it a little bit more uh, next time as well. Uh, let me just summarize uh, what I have said. What I have said so far is that, you know, we take ADS and in general, uh, you know, we have some set of operators that live on the boundary at all times. Those are distinct operators in an LQFT. They're all distinct operators. But we have said that in a theory of gravity, by combining this reach leader result with the remarkable fact that the energy can be measured from infinity, and therefore the projector on the vacuum is an element of the boundary algebra, we have proved that all information is available here. Let me just say that, that this, from the point of view of ADS-CFT, again, is a simple result. Because in ADS-CFT, uh, you know, we already said that all operators uh, uh, live in the CFT, and all operators in the time band are clearly complete, and they give you all information about the state. But here, we didn't argue using ADS-CFT. We argued using bulk gravity, that bulk gravity localizes quantum information in a very unusual way, in that if you go to this little time band on the boundary, you might have thought there is so much more freedom in the theory, but in fact, using the fact that this Riesch-Leader fact and using the Riesch-Leader theorem 
and this fact that the projector in the vacuum lives near the boundary, you can in fact get all information about the bulk from this little time map. Uh, so next time uh, we will emphasize uh, how this is not just an abstract result, uh, but there is a concrete manifestation of this result. So this is not just some result in algebraic field theory. This is not just an algebraic result. Uh, it's a physical result. It is, it is physical and we'll emphasize what that means in that you can really physically try and set up Jedankin experiments, you know, so that if you had astrophysicists here, uh, they would be able to determine what was happening in the bulk, which would clearly not be possible uh, in a theory of, uh, in a local quantum field theory. Uh, so we'll emphasize that, and then we'll prove a similar result in flat space, and then we'll go back to discussing the information paradox. As you can see, the linkages to the information paradox are hopefully already becoming clear. Now, the fact that you can get the information out near the boundary uh, is, uh, a manifestation of what we discussed earlier about how you know the fact that the information inside uh, is also available outside uh, but we'll come to that later uh, at this point i'll just stop here uh, and we can take more questions okay uh, so there were some questions and uh, i'm happy to take them now so i was wondering from the the first perspective the, the cause loop perspective why do you have to go uh, all the way to the boundary? Or can you also say, if you just look at a, a region in the bulk and you look at the, well, sort of say particles in a box, you look at the, the boundary of the box, <laughs> you have the information there. Yeah, so you would like to make a statement of that kind, but you know, uh, so that, that's, that's an excellent point. Indeed, you would like to say, so you'd like to make a stronger statement, right? You'd like to say that if I'm on a Cauchy slice and I, 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 I have a ball, and I have some region like outside the ball, I can make measurements outside the ball, I know what's happening inside the ball. Uh, it's very hard to make something like this precise because if you're just sitting somewhere in the bulk, uh, you know, uh, that this region outside this, this dashed region can also fluctuate, right? Uh, so uh, you have to, you know, it's very hard to set up some gauge invariant distinction of what the boundary of the region uh, that you're talking about is. And that's the same fact that, you know, if you try and define a local notion of energy inside a region by using the Gauss law, uh, you always run into trouble. I mean, you run into trouble even in classical general relativity uh, precisely because of this issue. Uh, there's other, another issue, by the way, that appears in the quantum theory. It's the fact that if you just take some compact region, then the energy inside is not positive definite. It could become negative. In fact, it's unbounded below. Uh, so there's no good notion of the projector and the vacuum if you just take some compact region. Uh, and so you have both these complications. The fact that it's hard to make this notion gauge invariant, that you just take this room and the boundary of the room and you can determine what's happening inside. Uh, because the boundary of the room can fluctuate and also the fact that you know this no we used importantly the positivity of energy uh, which is not true in some compact region uh, but all that being said uh, this is uh, i agree that there should be some sense in which morally something like this should be true uh, but we don't know how to do it at least nobody knows how to do it i mean it would be really great if something like this could be made precise uh, we'll say something of this kind uh, in flat space but you know you can go to null infinity and talk about some region outside and inside at null infinity. Uh, but yeah, it would be nice if this could be done directly in the bulk, but nobody knows how to do that. Okay, great, thanks. And then, because uh, regarding the negative energy, you said I was thinking about that before also. It's maybe a bit of a naive question, but I always thought that gravitational energy, the potential energy is negative. So in a sense that a, uh, a, a certain energy, is, if you uh, measure certain amount of energy it can still be generated in the sense that there's negative energy, so there's negative charge. Uh, okay, so it, from the point of view of infinity, you would still like to assume that, that you know, the energy in the world is always positive, that, you know, the vacuum is the lowest energy state and there is no state which has lower energy than the vacuum. So, you know, if you, you can have locally negative energies, but if you go out to infinity, uh, then there should be some notion of positivity of energy. Now, it's true that this has never been proved in any rigorous sense in a theory of quantum gravity, but you would expect uh, that it should be true uh, that you know, in 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 quantum gravity, the energy should be positive. Of course, in ADS-CFT, this is true because the boundary Hamiltonian does have a positive definite spectrum. I mean, positive just means bounded below. So every time I say positive, uh, we just mean it has to be bounded below. Uh, and if the theory is not bounded below, then in fact, many things that we said wouldn't hold, in, including this Riesz-Leder theorem. If the Hamiltonian is not bounded below, this property of analyticity would be lost. Uh, so somehow we we would like to assume that in a good theory of quantum gravity, the, Hamil the Hamiltonian as defined by the boundary energy is bounded below. Otherwise, you know, none of this would work. 
but then if you have something like negative energy, then a certain amount of energy, I say state with some amount of energy, uh, can still be degenerate then, right? Because, well, just like with charges, like you have a charge two, it can be uh, two positrons for four electrons, etc. Yeah. Uh, don't you run into this there then? But you see, degeneracy was not an issue for us. So uh, maybe I'll say a little bit more. Uh, so you could have, of course, exactly degenerate eigenstates. Uh, so remember, uh, we didn't say we just got, we just identified the state by measuring the energy. Uh, you always have degenerate energy eigenstates. In fact, in the argument that we have, you could even have global symmetries in the bulk, which may not exist in gravity for other reasons, for other reasons, but they don't affect our argument. Uh, and of course, you know, there are charges that commute with the Hamiltonian. So there are always degenerate energy eigenstates that you can have. Uh, but, you know, the way we identified the states was also by using these operators Xn and Xm. So it's important that the way we identified the state was not only by using the insertion of the energy, but also by using these operators. So it's the correlators of the energy with other operators that are giving you information. Uh, so the fact that you have degeneracies in energy eigenstates uh, does not spoil this argument. I mean, this argument, I mean, this is what we did as a proof right now. Uh, but you can, you can see the fact that you have degeneracies does not, you know, would not give you a counter example. And that's because you have also these insertions of these other operators. And as long as you have some operators that have different matrix elements on these different energy eigenstates, which are degenerate, uh, you will be good. Uh, and such operators you can, you can always find. Uh, and so it's, uh, you know, uh, you can have degeneracies in energy eigenstates, but we do need to use the fact that the Hamiltonian is bounded below. There's nothing below this vacuum. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. That helps. Yeah. I had a question related to the last yeah. point you made. Uh, so, yeah. it's for for ordinary gauge theories. No, I mean non gravitational gauge theories. Uh, there also you have. Uh, you said the issue was that if you you can't project a fixed charge state because there's a gauge invariant. Right. Uh, uh, you can uh, you you can project onto charge k, but it's not unique. I said I, not that it's not gauge invariant. Uh, yeah. So why, why why can't I say uh, why can't I repeat the argument you just made about uh, degenerate vacuum and. Let, let, let's try let's try and re repeat the argument so you know uh, so here here is the here's the argument uh, notice what i did here i took this state zero zero and i replaced this with the projector on the vacuum okay so this this part as i said till here we also true in gauge theory right so now you want to replace this argument by projecting onto states of zero charge if you project onto states of zero charge you will not project onto the state zero zero you will project onto all states of zero charge which include arbitrarily excited energy eigenstates so uh, there is, you know, the set of states of zero charge is infinite dimensional. Not only is it infinite dimensional, you know, you can act with local gauge invariant operators in gauge theory, and you will get another state of zero charge. So in a gauge theory, there is a sense of a local gauge invariant operator, which just acts, um, you know, which just acts here. Like you can take a Wilson loop and act with this Wilson loop in the square. And these little uh, observers near the boundary, maybe I should push them a little closer to the boundary so they're not close to Wilson loop, uh, are, are, you know, are, uh, can never do anything to detect this Wilson loop unless they wait to see the energy, you know, signs from the Wilson loop emerging. So in this little so, time band zero to epsilon, they can't detect the presence of this Wilson loop. And so the, two, things are, two things are not clear to me in this. Like for the Riesz-Lieders theorem itself, you needed just any state, right? Was it necessary that you had to create states on the vacuum? Yeah, but you needed any state. But you know, uh, notice that that uh, you know, so you could take some other state, but you can never project onto a specific state using a projector onto states of given charge. You so, know, you so could in the, in the gravitational theory, if I act with if you want some invariant, I mean, gauge invariant of operators, the vacuum still changes, right? And the energy doesn't change. Isn't it right? uh, so there is no notion of a local gauge invariant operator in a theory of gravity, as we discussed a few lectures earlier. Okay, you know, the I'm reason this naive work, this, so I, I, the curvature tensor is not an operator which I can act with. Uh, uh, you have to dress the curvature tensor. You know, if you take a curvature tensor at some point uh -huh, or you take like right. a Ricci scalar, you have to define what is the point at which it is acting at. And right, to right, define right. the point at which it is acting at, you have to dress it in some way. And therefore, there is no notion of a local gauge invariant operator. You know, you always okay, have to dress something with respect to infinity. Another way to say this is that the charge in gravity is the mass, is the energy. And to get a local operator, you have to have, you know, to get a gauge invariant operator, you have to have zero energy. But to have zero energy, you need to have infinite spread. You can't have finite spread and have zero energy. And so the okay. reason this argument, you know, there's no notion of a local Wilson loop in gravity like there is in gauge theories. 
Okay. Thank and you. that's why this doesn't give you a count taken. But you can see if you just run this argument through, you can't, you know, there is no other projector you could replace this, right? You could not replace this this argument by projecting onto states of zero charge. You, you see, even, even, even the correlations with the reach leader operators won't let me fix the state if I'm projecting onto a fixed charge state. Clearly not, because you have a Wilson loop. You know, you have a counter example. So whenever you get confused about this, just think about this fact that there's a unitary operator, a Wilson loop, which is a square that I drew in the middle, uh, which acts in a vacuum and generates, you know, zero and W on zero, like Wilson loop on zero are indistinguishable near the boundary. From asymptotic, op from A epsilon. Because this Wilson loop just commutes with all operators in A epsilon. So you should just, you know, whenever mm -hmm. you get confused about this, just think of the, the Wilson loop and in a scalar field theory, think of unitary operators, local unitary operators. And does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. So uh, was there any other question? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. Oh. Oh. I think Griffin has it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, maybe a uh, quick question, but but just to clarify, what um, uh, for, for this for this last picture, uh, what is the information needed on the boundary uh, to say something uh, on the bill? I mean, you still have to um, to measure the metric on the whole spatial slice of the boundary, right? So it's, it's in a sense still a super observer to say something about the whole uh, bill or. Uh it, you're right. It's an algebraic result. Uh, you know, it's it's the whole spatial slice in the boundary. So you have to surround. So you know, you're right that to, if you if you think about this, you have to surround uh, the region on the the bulk. You have to have these observers, and these observers need to communicate. Uh, but you know, this is the result that's relevant for us in the case of black holes because uh, you have to have a observer who surrounds the black hole. You know, you can't have radiation that's leaking out from one side, and that's why we are, we are focusing on this result. But you're right. It's an what we've proved right now is an algebraic result. And it's a statement that, you know, if you take the entire boundary at one time, that has information about the bulk. I mean, that's also how ADS safety works. And that's in general how holography works. Uh, you're right that if these observers, like these local observers were just living on one part of the boundary, they would not have information about the entire bulk. Uh, you can prove a more refined result. You know, if, they, if their observers were living on some section of the boundary, they would have information about some section in the bulk. Uh, but uh, for us, we just need the simplest result, which is if the observers have action, have access to the all observables on a, on a time band, then they have access to the entire bulk. Uh, but that already is a result which is not true in, in local QFT. So it's a very surprising result. Uh, but you're right that, uh, you know, it's, a, it's some observer who measures, or it's a set of observers who make measurements on the whole spatial slice on the boundary and then get together and determine things. But that's the way holography always works. Yeah, but, but so but maybe I'm just uh, way too quick in my reasoning, but, um, but, but, but this is also, uh, uh, this is also something which we can do because we we set uh, the the gravitational fluctu fluctuations on the boundary to uh, to zero. But if we somehow have some kind of gravitational fluctuation, would it? I mean, uh, would would uh, 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 the information then be local localized differently, or would we still need to super observe in that case? Uh, when you said we said gravitational fluctuations to zero, means just we said the asymptotic boundary conditions. Uh, so you could yeah. set different asymptotic boundary conditions where the information starts leaking from the boundary. Uh, so that would be mm. a different setup. But uh, uh, you know, you could uh, in this setup we are just looking at some normalizable boundary conditions, which is, we just fixed asymptotic boundary conditions, which is how we would do uh, gravity, uh, which is how you know we do. It's it's something you you need to do to specify uh, what the theory in the in the bulk is. Uh, so yeah. uh, I'm not sure what it means by uh, when you say you we have you know we do have gravitational fluctuations which we are measuring in some important way but they're subleading compared to the leading term so the leading term is ads and then we have subleading gravitational fluctuations which we are measuring yeah no i, I, I meant but, but i think uh, it, it comes to the point and it's hard to define a boundary still if we we still have some some kind of the, the subleading uh, fluctuations yeah. on the boundary but uh, then, then it's hard to d define a boundary right uh, yeah, we can, and we will discuss this a little bit when we discuss islands and so on. So there is there is a setup in which this has been discussed a lot in the recent literature, where you can take the boundary and you can set these transparent boundary conditions. So we'll discuss it uh, in a couple of weeks from now. Uh, so that's that's a, a good question one could ask. Uh, but there's another question one could ask, is which is one where, where one has an autonomous theory. 
Uh, and then one could also ask questions about how information leaks out, which is what we will discuss when we discuss islands. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, sorry, Richard I, has his hand up. I think uh, he's had. I think uh, Rifat, I think you should just speak. Uh, uh, you have your hand up for long times. Yeah. Uh, no, I can ask a question after Lorenzo Rossi. Oh, there's somebody else. Also. Sorry, I didn't. See. Sorry, he's no, gone. No, yeah. please, please. You, you, uh, you have your it's hand. It's going to be a bit long this way. Like, uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Then, um, I had a question regarding the fact that we are not assuming H to be the Hamiltonian. Yeah. The further H. Uh, yeah, that's what you asked earlier, and I, I actually I realized yeah. I didn't I didn't deal with it very very well. So you know, indeed, what we what we required here was that P zero. Uh, I mean, I said it very fast. Uh, what we required here actually was that P0 is an asymptotic observer. Uh, I don't know where I said it. Uh, yeah, uh, it was this, this box statement. You know, what we required, so, you know, what we really require is that for low energy states is that, you know, if you measure the metric at infinity, you do this integrated metric observation, you find that the metric is not disturbed or the integral of the metric is not disturbed. Then you know that you're in the vacuum. So that's what we really demanded. So, you know, it shouldn't be that in the theory of quantum gravity, there is some state uh, in the theory, uh, which is some state which has some excitation, but you, have, you can hide it entirely from the boundary. So, you know, it should not be the case that there's some way to hide energy from the boundary at low energies. So what the real, the, the thing that we used in this proof was the fact that the projector on the vacuum was an element of A epsilon, uh, which is a different, a slightly different from assuming that the full Hamiltonian was an element of A epsilon. Let me just try and explain uh, what the distinction is. Uh, the distinction is that, you know, as, as we said, uh, we have this, we have this Hilbert space, uh, uh, which we schematically think of and we know from ADS CFT and so on, where you have the vacuum, you have these energy eigenstates, and then at some point you, you go up and then you have these black holes. Uh, and at, when you have black holes, you know, the gaps become very small. The gaps become like of size e to the mi minus n in what we are calling not n squared. Uh, and then uh, someone could say, you know, you, me you measure this metric and how do you know if you're in one black hole microstate or the other black hole microstate uh, that you will really be able to measure these uh, exponentially small energy gaps using this Hamiltonian. Uh, and uh, maybe you can, and you could make an assumption that you this Hamiltonian, boundary Hamiltonian is just exact. Uh, but, uh, you know, the assumption that we needed here was just that if this boundary Hamiltonian gives you zero, if the expectation value of this is zero, uh, then you're in the vacuum. So we only need some assumption about what's happening at low energies. And P0 is acting here. Now it could be that, you know, uh, may maybe, you know, you, uh, you can't have even the low energy physics being correct without having some exact result. Uh, but the precise assumption we needed was only that the low energy physics comes out correctly using this boundary term. And not that you can differentiate these e to the minus n separated high energy eigenstates. So that, uh, that's a subtlety which yeah I, I didn't emphasize enough in the lecture but that's the uh, that's the reason we're not assuming that h is the exact hamiltonian okay okay thanks okay thank you uh hi yeah. uh so so let's say if i have a, a finite boundary which is not yeah. like infinite and uh and I make sure that uh, everywhere in the interior at first, like before some time, the uh, and nowhere the energy is negative. Mm -hmm. And then at the, since this uh, T menu is covariantly conserved, the expectation value of T menu is covariantly conserved, uh, I would expect that uh, the total energy in the interior would uh, not uh, fall, uh, fall below negative as long as I don't send in some negative energy flux. Okay. And uh, in that setting, can I run the entire same arguments and conclude that the uh, uh, information about uh, on any Cauchy slice which goes into the bulk is available on the part of the Cauchy slice which meets the boundary? Uh, yeah, so, so I thought you said, uh, sorry, so, uh, uh, so it, uh, this, this result we already proved, but I thought you want to prove a stronger result, which is that you have, yeah. you have some Cauchy slice, which is this is r equal to zero. We already said all the information is available in r equal to infinity, but I thought you want to now say- Now take a finite thing. Box yes. Here, right? Right. Uh, yes, so, yes. Uh, yeah, um, uh, as I said, it would, be, it would be great to prove such a result, but uh, it's a, um, I, I, I don't know how to do it. Uh, for the, um, 
Yeah, so you you'd like to somehow restrict to states which are which are which have. Yes, some... yes, yes. It looks like the only thing that uh, uh, stays in the uh, way of doing this is that the energy can become negative locally, and I just make sure that it was not that to start with, and I know energy is uh, currently conserved. Then I can uh, proceed, I guess. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I agree that uh, you you yeah. If you restrict it to some set of states uh, where you know that uh, yeah, where where you where you make some assumption or you put some prior about the mm. set of kinds of excitations you can have here, uh, then you you might be able to make an argument. I mean, it would be great to make this more precise, uh, but I agree it's plausible that if you give me the right priors on what kinds of excitations you can have in mm. R equal to zero, and by making observations in R equal to L, I could determine what was happening uh, inside. Okay. I, I agree. And uh, but, yeah, yes. okay. I just want to say in the quantum theory, you know, this is this is tricky because uh, when you say energy is positive in the quantum theory, uh, you mean that you have no component of negative energy, or do you mean the expectation value is positive and so on? So you'll have to be uh, careful about making all this precise. Uh, but uh, uh -huh. I agree that uh, something like this should be doable. But I don't know how it can be done. But yeah, I agree it should be doable. Okay. And uh, uh, from this this conclusion, it looks like the uh, operators which acts in the center of a Cauchy slice also belongs to the algebra of observables in close to the boundary. So this yeah. is what uh, is like the third resolution to the monogamy paradox that you uh, yeah. talked about. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And yeah, yeah. okay. And uh, about observables in quantum gravity, let's say like uh, I'm sending in some uh, observer. Uh, with carrying some director or something and that the director can like measure uh, the strength of the tidal forces and uh, if he falls into a black hole close to the singularity ultimately that observation will uh, tend to infinity right the strength of those tidal forces will tend to infinity yes, yes, which means yes. some observation on the boundary some observables on the boundary use expectation value also must tend to infinity there must be some uh, things on the boundary that tends to infinity. Yes. Is it like that? Yes, okay. I agree. Uh, that I mean, I, 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 again, I don't know. How, this has not been made very precise, but you're right. There should be some sign of the singularity on the boundary, and it would be nice to mm -hmm. determine what exactly uh, probes the singularity. Uh, and you're right that there, there, there are some things that should diverge. You know, one can ask uh, simpler questions uh, even before you go to the singularity. For instance, if you have the inner horizon of a black hole, uh, can you probe the fact that the inner horizon is unstable? Uh, without even having uh -huh. to go to the singularity. So yeah, they're, they're, you're right. That there should be some some diagnostic of all of these things on the boundary. Mm -hmm. But it isn't like the boundary three is a well-defined quantum field theory and uh, nothing blows up? Uh, no, but even if it's a well-defined quantum That's... field theory, it doesn't mean that nothing blows up, right? Because you know you there are always these unbounded operators, and it, it's clearly it'll be the you know first of all when you say blow up, uh, you might have to be careful about. Yeah. But, yeah. About many things. You know, blow up, uh, whether that means uh, becoming order n or becoming really infinity. Uh, but you know, even if it's a well-defined quantum field theory, every all these operators, local operators, are always unbounded. So the fact that you get infinity for some result doesn't make, doesn't matter. Uh, but for the physical question you're asking, which is the question for what happens near singularity of a black hole, you know, if you really could do some boundary calculation, it would be nice to see some resolution of the singularity. Uh, but I mean, you know, see how the fact that things don't really become infinite. But of course, you know, we, we, there's nothing we have said right now that helps us in answering that question. We have a, a more abstract result, and next time we'll make it precise in low energy states. But um, making it precise in, you know, extracting more physics from it in black hole states is not something that I mean, it's a much harder problem. Okay, and and nothing uh, uh, so far yet uh, lets us conclude that the field theory on the boundary. In the like infinite boundary is some sort of a large end field theory, right? Uh, no, no, no. There's nothing that we have yeah, said okay. so far that that. In fact, you know, uh, I said that this explains some aspects of ADS CFT, but it only explains the information theoretic aspect. It explains the fact mm. that all the information about the bulk is available near the boundary. It doesn't explain uh, any of the dynamical aspects of ADS CFT. You know, the fact. I mean, you might have guessed it's a conformal field theory, but there are many other dynamical aspects of the fact that it's a conformal field theory, uh, which we're not seeing mm -hmm. emerging. So there's some information theoretic aspects, which we'll also see. I mean, you know, because we're interested in black holes and how information is stored, uh, there's an information theoretic aspect that we are seeing is common to all the theories of gravity. Uh, but there's a more dynamical question you'd like to ask, which is the boundary dynamics is described by a local quantum field theory, uh, which we're not seeing here. I mean, you know, we didn't see the fact even that the boundary dynamics is described by a local QFT. 
uh, which would give us other interesting constraints. For instance, you know, it might tell us there are no global symmetries in the bulk, which we don't see any hint of here uh, in these information okay. theoretic arguments. Uh, so, so, so yeah, so it's it's explaining one aspect of, of holography. But you had the Hamiltonian for gravity as a boundary term. So that can be used as a field theory Hamiltonian on the boundary. Can yeah, but you have, yeah. Uh, yeah. But you have to impose a little bit more. You know, for instance, uh, you have to impose then that, uh, uh, you're right, but you also have to impose then locality on the boundary and try and find dynamics that's consistent mm. with locality on the boundary. Uh, so th that would be an additional, you know, uh, program, uh, which, which maybe, which would probably lead you to recover many of the properties of ADS-CFT, but that's not what we have done. Okay. And the final two questions. Uh, so when you constructed this O of T comma uh, Omega in the previous lecture, those things, uh, and you also had uh, correlations, like because you can, you know how they act on the vacuum. So you can construct those uh, correlators. Uh, 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 in each, it, at first it looked like uh, just endpoint correlation functions for field theory in a lower dimension. But, uh, uh, but we, uh, does that like uh, satisfy all the axioms of the Whiteman uh, axioms uh, so sorry. that we can say it is a field theory. Uh, yeah, so, you know, that would be, uh, you'd have to make yeah. some additional assumption. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you, you probably, uh, uh, yeah, you know, you'll have to assume that locality on the boundary is, is exact, and then you'll have to put in additional assumptions about what this boundary uh, theory does. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, for instance, you'll have to impose crossing. Uh, you know, you'll have to, you'll have to impose some OP and then you'll have to impose crossing and so on. So you'd have to impose more constraints uh, than what we have imposed. So, you know, we used uh, the fact that you could get the Hilbert space by acting with these boundary operators, and then there's some version of Riesz leader, and then information is available. But uh, to find that it is a field theory, for instance, you would, you know, you'd have to impose, uh, I mean, maybe uh, I, the most important thing might be to impose crossing. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, if you impose crossing, then you would start getting many more constraints. Um, so uh, we, we haven't done that. Uh, and I think, I mean, I think one, you know, one could, because it's still true that even in gravity, you expect that locality is asymptotically exact and you should be able to maybe write down some OP and then impose crossing and so on. Uh, but uh, that's not, I mean, we didn't do any of that. Okay. And lastly, at one point you said, uh, we, we haven't invoked ADS-CFT anywhere until now. Uh, uh, yeah. But it seems to me that in the last lecture, when you uh, uh, claimed that the span of o, O's on acting on ket zero, that is the full Hilbert space, which also contains states uh, like black hole states in the bulk, those kind of things. Uh, uh, that statement sort of uh, invokes this holography already, right? Uh, no, uh, because you know the, the statement was that, you know, uh, we looked at this span like X of T1 or O of T1, O of Tn, and we just said this is dynamically closed under Hamiltonian evolution because if you evolve under H, it goes to like O of T1 prime, O of Tn prime. So the thing we've been saying so far is that this Hilbert space is dynamically closed under time evolution. Uh, then we, we use some physical insight and we said, oh, you know, we think it should also contain black holes and so on. Uh, but for the theorem we yeah. proved, we just said you, know, you, could, you, could, you should be able to formulate the theory in this Hilbert space because it's dynamically closed because under time evolution, you know, it evolves to another state of the same kind. Uh, and then if you make physical assumptions about what the theory should be, you expect the theory should also have black holes and, and all these other things. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, the fact that it's closed under time evolution is clear. We, we showed that. And uh, we didn't need to invoke ADS-CFT for this. I'll think about this more carefully. But, but right now it looks like the very fact of, uh, say, uh, say it's all right, it is closed under dynamic evolution, but by using the physical argument that uh, it will form black holes and saying, putting that by hand, into the formalism that, that these states to, are to be interpreted as uh, states that have formed black hole. Uh, right now, it looks like uh, we are already invoking this yeah. holographic response. But I'll think about this more. Yeah, the statement is, you know, there is some consistent theory of quantum gravity in which, you, you know, you and we expect you can formulate the theory in the Hilbert space. Then, uh, you know, we, we don't know what that theory is ex in any case except for ADS-CFT, but we expect that whatever the theory is, there should be some sense in which you sh it should have black holes and other things. Uh, maybe it'll become more clear when we when we make a similar argument in flat space. Now there we'll say there's some Hilbert space, and we actually don't know what the you know what the full dual of uh, flat space is. Uh, but it'll still be true that the Hilbert space is closed, and we'll still be able to make an argument about how quantum information is localized, uh, without saying so much in detail about you know 
what the structure of the Hilbert space is. So if I haven't, so if it's true that we haven't invoked the area CFT, uh, can we conclude that this whole thing is a derivation of the holographic principle? Uh, yeah, you could conclude that it's a derivation of an aspect of the holographic principle, which is the fact that information is localized near the boundary. So uh, this this yeah. this argument I give is in I mean I th you you should think of it as a derivation of this fact that information is available near the boundary. You see the the fact okay. is that we prove that all information in this Hilbert space that is written on the board is available near the boundary, and so indeed you mm -hmm. can think of it as a derivation of the fact that you know information in gravity is available near the boundary. And then you can, the question okay. you're asking is what is the information? You know do you have black holes? What is the structure of the Hilbert space? But the holographic principle doesn't immediately tell you about you know what is the detailed structure of the Hilbert space. It just tells you information is available near the boundary. So or at least this principle of holography of information is just based. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. okay thanks.